Hello, welcome to uh, what are week week twelve now? Wow, we are in the last quarter of the semester. Oh my gosh, time flies when you're having fun, does it? Doesn't it? All right, so we're in our last two chapters of discussion. So just as a reminder, we got this week, and then we've got uh, next week, and then we got an exam in week fourteen. So it's all coming up. Uh, I there's a whole lot coming up on the future schedule. I'm not going to talk about everything that's done because I've talked about it already in multiple classes. I do want to remind you of two specific things that are very, very relevant, okay? First one is relevant for this coming Wednesday. You recall that we're having a speaker in this very room. It will be our executive in residence. And uh, I've asked you to prepare some questions for executive in residence so that you'll be prepared to ask questions. And uh, that is due beginning a class on Wednesday. So please don't forget about that. I'm guessing that you probably received a notification at the beginning of class saying these questions are due. So that's just a reminder. Please make sure you do that. It's worth five points. As a reminder, all assignments need to be complete if you want to opt out of the final exam. So if you conveniently forget that you have to do this assignment, it's only five points, but it also means that you're going to be with me during finals week. And let's be honest, I'm a nice guy, but nobody really wants to spend finals week with me. That's just the way it works. So please make sure you complete that uh, assignment. And then uh, other thing, um, I had two things and our member member is going to talk about it. Uh, I don't know what the other thing was. Okay, I will say one thing. If I remember it, then I'll bring it back up. That's that's the problem with getting old. You, you don't make notes and you say, this is really important. And all of a sudden you forget what was really important. And I know it's I know it's important. I know because I thought about it and I said, this is something I want to talk about. And just completely, totally bombed on it. So yeah. Uh, this week, we are talking about information security and computer fraud. I bumped this up to this particular week because this is going to be very relevant to our speaker who's going to be coming in. We are just going to scratch the surface, but I think most of you already have some experience and some history with this. Most of you were probably here during uh, April of 2023, which I guess was a year ago today. And uh, if you remember, there was something interesting that happened during April of 2023, and I was actually teaching this very class. We were over in 1420 because we were doing some work on the computers, and uh, I was just a little bit annoyed because I couldn't access the Y drive. So I had to download my stuff and put it in a jump drive and uh, I had to get the access. Couldn't access Google Drive either. And in the middle of my lecture, after we'd gone over our Excel assignment, I said, oh, you need to shut down the computers right now. And I'm like, I'll shut it down when I'm done teaching. And uh, it turns out that, uh, yeah, it was the, that was the ransomware attack that occurred at Truman State. And uh, there's a lot of lot of uh, differing opinions about the ransomware attack. I will say that uh, different uh, instructors approached it differently. I will say I will also say that uh, the uh, ITS uh, group at Truman State they actually did a very admirable job. We're going to talk a little bit about some aspects of this. We are definitely going to talk about ransomware. Um, it's not as simple a thing as you sound as you might think. Um, there's a lot of different aspects, a lot of different concerns about cybersecurity, but it's kind of as, as bad as the cyber attack was, it's kind of nice to have a practical application or practical example to use to talk about this particular topic. And then we're going to talk about computer fraud, which is just basically fraud, but we're going to talk about the computerized aspects of it. And I, I, I used to be a forensic accountant, so I'm familiar with some of the very basic aspects, but we're going to go into a little bit more detail about the individual issues there. And give me just a second. That's what happens when your throat gets dry. I can't talk. But the, computer, the camera's still working, so that's, uh, that's the good news. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about, let's get the kind of the boring stuff out of the way, talk about the different definition of information security. You probably will see this in your reading. If you do any review on this, you'll hear it referred to as InfoSec, which uh, that seems like a needless, a needless abbreviation, but there it is. That's what it's called. So InfoSec management has been identified as a key technology issue in business account and accounting. I will say that with respect to technology and business and accounting, the probably the biggest technology area that you're going to encounter in the future is going to be AI. I think that's number one with a bullet, and that's going to be the, the, the biggest one by a fairly large margin. After that, we're going to be talking about information security, which is a broad category. It's going to have a lot to do with cybersecurity and just kind of general uh, technology security topics. We're kind of lumping this all in together. We're talking about different aspects of it, but how we convey information on a secure basis, how we maintain information. Uh, this also has a lot to do with privacy, which we're not going to go into too much of detail. I think data privacy is very important, but uh, there's only a certain allotment of time that we have to talk about this topic, and uh, we're not going to go into the NIST framework to a much degree. Um, so critical factor in maintaining system integrity, which makes sense because if you're going to be a business and you can't maintain system or you can't maintain your information properly, if you can't maintain the, uh, the security of that information, you probably are not going to maintain that information for a very long time. 
So if users can perform the intended functions of a system without being degraded or impaired by unauthorized manipulation, the system has maintained its integrity. So that's how we talk about the term system integrity. That's effectively the way that we define this particular concept is saying that can people use the system and not have any interruptions of service, have not have any uh, problems with their the usage of the information, the information itself remains secure. So I think this is a very concise and very basic definition. Obviously, this diagram here, which uh, I downloaded from Google, so it's not my own diagram, that talks about uh, in all the different aspects of InfoSec. It's much, much broader science than what we're going to give it credit for today. But at the very basic level, it is just as it sounds, the maintaining the security of information. That's really all there is to it. Well, we are going to talk about something that's very, very important with respect to information security and something I do expect you to know. It's called the CIA triad. Now, I realize when I say CIA triad, that probably sounds like a combination of a secret government agency combined with a crime group. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? There may be some CIA triad thing in, in, the, in, the, in the cinema that you talk about and you see in the movies, but that's, that's a different thing. CIA triad is basically maintaining certain aspects of information security. Bowels protection of three different concepts, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data. So these are fairly intuitive. They're fairly easy to define when we talk about these items. Oh, there the camera went. Okay, so goodbye, everybody. Uh, you're just going to hear my voice along with the blank screen, apparently. All right. So confidentiality. Uh, confidentiality is information should not be accessible to unauthorized individuals or processes, which probably goes without saying. If you're operating in a secure system, you want only the people who access have access to the information to be able to access the information. We've talked about this to some degree already. We've talked about segregation of duties within NetSuite and saying certain individuals cannot access certain parts of the system, whereas other individuals can't access other parts of the system. And that is a very basic premise. That has a lot to do with the controls that are placed within the information system. This goes beyond that. This actually means unauthorized access to the system, preventing people from accessing the system externally or internally if they're not necessarily able to. Integrity of data, this is basically just saying information is accurate and complete. We want to make sure that the information that we have within the system maintains that integrity, that we can actually rely on the data itself to be useful for the, what we for whatever its intended purpose is. And then probably most importantly, availability. Information systems are accessible on demand. This is the one that we actually talked about. This is the one that we experienced last year, last spring, right around this time. We said, oh, we no longer have availability of the system. We no longer have availability to information or data. And it created a huge problem just for something like just a small organization like Truman State. Now expand that to a pretty substantial scope. Imagine that you're a much larger organization like Facebook. Has anybody kind of followed Facebook's uh, security issues over the past year? They've had two separate incidences where the information was not available. And the users just started yelling, the sky is falling, okay? And, and that's just, I, I didn't even notice because I was not, I was teaching at the time these were happening, but it was like four hour blackout periods. And for some, for some organizations, this is legitimately a concern because they actually operate heavily through Facebook. Their business protocols actually operate through that platform. So availability of that type of system, obviously very, very critical and very, very important. All right, so some concerns about information or information systems, they face a very diverse array of threats, which are listed up here. Now, I am going to talk about a few of these. I know I listed a whole bunch of these. These are the ones that are talked about in the textbook. I'm actually going to talk about some of these very specifically, and then I'm going to talk about a few more. So the ones that I talk about are the ones that I think you should focus on for the exam, because I think these are the most modern concerns. These are the most recurrent threats that we're concerned about. Now, obviously, things like viruses and uh, spam, those are going to be ever-present threats that you're going to be a, a forced to or forced to deal with. But these are things that existed for many, many years. The ones that I want to talk about are ones that are either, either are very, very, very omnipresent and very, very uh, problematic, no matter what issue, what area you're in or they're fairly recent ones that are, uh, have come up. So the first one I wanna talk about is social engineering, which social engineering has been around for a very long time, and yet it still happens to be one of the most prime or well, most common ways that people get access to systems, unauthorized access to systems. So this was something that uh, back, uh, if you go back 30 years ago, the big uh, area of this, when we talk about social engineering is uh, don't at leave access to information that uh, people should not have access to. Because 30 years ago, security of systems was usually just kind of maintained through a simple password. And so if you're maintaining a password, you probably say, I don't want to forget my password. You write it down on a post-it note and stick it in your cubicle. 
All right. That's the easy way to think about it. Now, we kind of cringe at that nowadays because we have to maintain like roughly one million passwords. I think how, how many of you guys think think that's probably correct? Pretty accurate summary. I don't know. I, I know you're not supposed to use the same password on different devices, but literally, literally there are not enough words in the English language if I tried to maintain a different password for every single device that I have to or single, single uh, site that I use. So uh, social engineering basically says is that you access information through different mediums and platforms that you access unauthorized access to a system. Now, back in the day, you just wander around an office and you go look in somebody's cubicle and you see, oh, their password is chicken123, all right? By the way, I didn't make up that password. That was an actual password to a recent ransomware attack. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, just if you think I'm making up no or making up random words and numbers, that was that was a legitimate one that hurt. Uh, Kurt, it was a co-op in uh, northern or co-op in southern Iowa that actually it was attacked a couple of years ago. So anyway, um, yeah, so you write that on a post-it note. Somebody now has information that they can access. And now we know in the today day and age that that's not something we should uh, we should uh, do. Uh, people are a lot smarter with their security. Plus, there's a lot there's multiple levels of security, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. But there's still ways that you can get around this. There's still social engineering, uh, social engineering devices that are a little bit less obvious and a little bit more devious as the nature. Has anybody ever gone to social media and completed one of those uh, quizzes online? It says, hey, you take this quiz and you'll find out which friends character are you, okay? Which uh, mm -hmm. I, I can imagine that you've probably seen some of those and you've probably seen friends that's like, I'm Rachel, isn't that great to you? It's like, uh, yeah. What is the purpose of doing something like that? Well, it's it's basically the whole purpose is data mining. They're trying to get information about you. And, and in, in an innocuous source, they're trying to get information so they can market better products to you. Obviously, by saying that you're taking this quiz, you're probably a fan of the TV show Friends. But some of these are a little bit more dubious. And they're doing these what these items called or these items that would relate to social engineering. For example, if you take a quiz and say, what is your mother's maiden name? Well, where have you obviously seen your mother's maiden name before? It's usually a security question for the types of devices that you would use or for the types of engagements that you use uh, that you would want to actually prohibit access to. So social engineering can be a little bit more seedy if you think about this type of data mining that takes place. So if you do one of these quizzes and ask, uh, what's your mother's maiden name? What street did you grow up on? Uh, where do you hide your key when you go on vacation? Things like that. Uh, probably want to get away from those types of quizzes. Those are probably not going to be helpful for you. Then data breaches. Data breaches are becoming, uh, I've been fairly common, becoming more and more common. This is just basically access to information. Um, this is really, really problematic, was really problematic in the late 2010s, uh, where the security was security protocols were in place, but they were not being heavily used, but people started used, understanding the value of data. I think I talked a little bit about Cambridge Analytica earlier in the semester. Cambridge Analytica was a massive data breach. It was not marketed as a breach. It was kind of considered to be legitimate. But basically, it gave access to data to people who didn't even authorize access to their data. So that would be an example of that. Ransomware is one of my favorite topics to talk about and one that we're all very familiar with because of the uh, Truman State attack. But this is basically unauthorized access, and they lock you out of the system and say, you cannot utilize any of these items unless you pay us a ransom. Now, to Truman State's credit, they did a really nice job. They had a two they had a, a two week backup protocol. I think that that was in place. They may have changed that, but uh, the they actually used their backup files to kind of restore access to the system, and then they did a little bit more to uh, restore long term access for for the entire summer last year. I was on Google Mail, which that was kind of unfortunate, but for the most part, I was still able to access and use the systems uh, despite like that two week window when we couldn't do anything. So they did a really nice job of that. Other organizations have not been so lucky. And you have to keep in mind that Truman State, it was really inconvenient. And it was really problematic. Some of you may have said, this is this really sucks. I can't get access to these uh, slides because I can't get access to Blackboard. And I will agree with you, that's problematic. But it's not the end of the world in that situation. What would leg legitimately be the end of the world for some people is if they did a ransomware attack on a hospital. And they locked out medical records for people who are about to have life-saving surgeries. That is a lot bigger concern, a much bigger concern. And that's where the problems with ransom come into place. It's like, do we pay the ransom? And the answer wants to be no, but in the, that situation, you might literally be uh, ending lives by answering the question that way. So that's a much bigger concern area. Uh, some other ones that are not on this list, but I think they're important to talk about. Phishing, which it's capital P-H-I-S-N-G, uh, not phishing as in uh, like that. By the way, it's not going to be on YouTube, so nobody's going to see my rod and reel, my clever rod and reel thing. But I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and describe all of the actions that I'm doing, so people on YouTube can appreciate this. I looked like I was throwing casting a rod and reel. Okay, but you probably could figure out because I was making a stupid joke about it. 
anyway, uh, so phishing, this is basically where you're trying to get information through uh, by pretending to be an unauthorized source. And you may have seen the uh, you may have seen the emails that occur. It happens pretty heavily at Truman State. Although I will say that the new email client is much better about filtering out those uh, types of scams than they used to be. Um, I remember when I first started at Truman State, I was teaching a summer course back in 2015. I did not realize that the phishing was such a problem at Truman State, and I just kind of blindly said, "Oh, I got to do a Blackboard update." Click, you know, and then put in my uh, put in my product or my information. And they shut it down right away. They said, hey, yeah, you clicked on something you shouldn't have. I said, no, I didn't. Oh, yeah, yes, I, I totally did. Yeah. So I've not really fallen for a phishing scheme since then. So there, there's that. But it's very easy to do. Uh, one thing that's not as relevant to Truman State and their information system, but is becoming more prominent as we're starting to see a move towards crypto assets is crypto jacking, which is just as it sound, getting a sounds, getting access to crypto assets that you don't have act or shouldn't aren't authorized to utilize. So crypto jacking, as we start moving towards more digital currencies, that's going to become more prominent and more of a concern. So that's something to consider. And then uh, Internet of Things attacks, which uh, Internet of Things is just basically vernacular for devices that don't necessarily are not considered to be utilizing the Internet, utilizing the Internet. Like this is becoming far, far more common as we start seeing things like thermostats in homes utilizing Internet. You can actually adjust the thermostat in your house by going on a computer and say, all right, I'm out of the house for the next two weeks, turn the thermostat down to 65 so I'm not paying ridiculous air conditioning or ridiculous heating bills, or maybe turn it up to 85 if you're not there because you don't want to pay air conditioning. So those are susceptible to attacks as well. In fact, uh, one of my favorite things to talk about, remember I, I like to talk about John Oliver and last week tonight, they had a ransomware attack occur on many people's devices within their house. They were, the, 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 crypt, or the, the attackers were going into the uh, thermostats and turning thermostats all the way up to 95 and saying, we're going to leave it at 95 unless you pay us a ransom. And I'll be honest, if that happened to my, I don't, my, my, my thermostat is not on the internet. So just so you know, you can't do that to me. But uh, if that happens, I'd be like, okay, well, I don't really care what the money is. I'm turning, I'm paying it right now. I can't handle 95 degree weather. That's just no, not in my house anyway. So, yeah. Um, and then one thing that's not necessarily a, a threat, it's not a, not, not really a threat, but something that's really prominent and co concerning is the current shortage of cybersecurity professionals. That we're starting to see a really large demand for people who can actually be skilled in this area. And I will tell you, you will be knowledgeable about cybersecurity when you leave Truman State. Most of you will not be what we would consider cybersecurity professionals. It is a burgeoning field and a very, very opportunistic one for you. Um, that being said, we're way short on where we need to be for our current infrastructure. Uh, when I looked at the last stats, which is like 2022, they said that there were basically a half a million job openings that were open in this area alone. OK, half a million. Consider that that, that given the population, that this is the United States alone, not just in the world. The ha United States alone, half a million job offerings. So that tells you how far behind we are in this area. Some some organizations do not have a trained cybersecurity professional on their in their group. And I think they said something like 80 percent of all hospitals do not have a trained cybersecurity professional. So remember, I said hospitals are very vulnerable to certain types of attacks and they don't have cybersecurity professionals. Yeah, that's not a good combination. That's not a good combination right there. <laughs> all right. So what are some uh, what are some uh, preventive controls that we can utilize in IT systems? So there's two categories, two basic categories that we're going to be concerned about. So the first one is going to be encryption, which is basically encoding plain text information into a non-readable form or ciphertext for the purpose of data transmission or storage. It is just as it sounds. It's it's a little bit like just reorganizing the information or to, to hide what the actual detail is and then sending it to the party. We're going to talk about the forms of encryption here in just a second. But let's talk about the second category of preventive control, and that's called authentication. This is the process of establishing the origin of information or determining the identity of a user, process, or device. Now, both of these are forms of authentication. We tend to think of the latter as the primary form of authentication, but the former can also be a reasonable one. So some examples of authentication, you probably know the first one. It's very, very obvious. It's something that you encounter every single day. That's when you log on to the Truman State system, you probably have to enter your password, or at least one of the systems you have to enter your password. I have to do it multiple times when I when I go to my office because I lock my computer so that nobody can actually get to my system. So that I go in and type in my password. I do it when I come into the classroom. It happens just kind of without thinking anymore. So something that's very, very common and current. Um, so both user IDs and passwords are a form of authentication. I said passwords, but we can talk about user IDs in that context as well. 
And then more recently, we've started seeing the, the advent of multi-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication. And again, everybody in this room is familiar with some form of multi-factor authentication. You probably saw me at the beginning of class. I was struggling with that myself because I had to log into Microsoft Office to get access to it. And we had to go through the uh, the Truman State authentication system, which is on the smartphone. And fortunately, I remembered my phone. I didn't leave in the office, so I was able to log in. Okay. That's one form. Okay. That would kind of be a code. We could also use tokens. Uh, biometrics, which you may be familiar with. Biometrics are basically fingerprint scans. They can be scans of other items, but that's a common one. Uh, I do have that on my on my iPhone. Is that uh, if I don't have my I don't want to type in my code, I can just put my thumb there, and then actually it's my iPad. Sorry, my iPad. I don't know why I'm holding it up because the camera's not working anyway. Okay, but I can actually just put my thumb there, and that's a form of authentication. Nobody else can use it unless they have the code. Then facial recognition. That's the phone right there. That's the facial. The recognize my facial recognition. And then identity questions, those are ones that we're already familiar with because of what we utilized in NetSuite, and we've seen those as well. All of these can be forms of multi-factor authentication, and even though we kind of get bored and uh, bored or get bored, and we think that it's just kind of an onerous task to have to go through all of these again, those additional levels of security do security those additional levels of security do prevent unauthorized access to systems that we might not otherwise want them people have access to. All right, let's talk about go back to encryption. So what are some factors of encryption? Well, first of all, it has to actually have sufficient key, uh, key length. And we talk about uh, key length, we're talking about 128-bit encryption minimum. Most systems now operate a little bit higher than that. I think 256 is the smallest I've seen recently. Again, these are kind of in factors of uh, powers of two, which uh, we talk about uh, uh, bit length. 128-bit is uh, two to the seventh power, I believe. And then we go to the eighth power, it's 256. To the ninth power, we do 512. And then I've seen some systems that operate on uh, 1,000 something or other. Uh, so which would be uh, 1,024, which would be to the 10th power. So all of these uh, all of these links are basically add additional labels of security. And the idea being is that you have to actually know what the entire encryption is for all 128 bits to be able to access it. It becomes more and more secure the longer the, the bit length is. And there's also forms of uh, encryption methods, symmetric key and asymmetric key, which we're going to talk about here in just a second, as well as just having strong policies on key management are essential for information security. So people not only need to have uh, the have these policies in place, organizations not, not only need to have these policies in place, but the people within the organization need to understand what the policies are, which is just good information for a good control system. So let's talk about symmetric key and asymmetric key encryption. So what are they? So first of all, symmetric key encryption is tends to be fast and very powerful. So it's a faster of the two, but it's also more costly to implement and maintain. It's also generally used by large organizations for internal communication and transmissions. So this diagram kind of explains how this works. We actually start out with a document, then it's locked, okay, with a key. And the, the key is kind of a, a visual illustration. The idea is that we lock it, we encrypt it. And so then we have an encrypted item. And in order to be able to access it, you have to have the same key to unlock it. So if we think about this from a from a, 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 a padlock perspective, can it actually be different keys? The answer is yes, but it has to be a copy of the same key. You know, so you, you can have multiple people who can actually enter the, your, your domicile, your place of residence, but the same key has to be utilized. Even though it's a copy of the key, it can actually be the same key. So be multiple people can have access to it, but it needs to be the same key that's used, the same decryption algorithm that's used in this particular situation. Now, how does this differ from asymmetric key, or asymmetric key encryption? Well, with an asymmetric key encryption, we're using something that's much slower but it's, and not suitable for large data sets, but it's generally used for external communications and transmissions. So these are people outside of an organization that need to have access. So you'll see that we have a very similar diagram here. We have an encryption with a key, but then we have a decryption with the receiver's private key, and there's not the same thing, okay? They're not the same keys that are being used. Different individuals will have different keys, and all of these keys are viable depending on their identity. So how to think about this would actually be like an ATM card. Let's assume that everybody in this room all use the same bank. I, I, I operate out of U.S. Bank, so we'll assume everybody operates out of U.S. Bank. So we all have access to the U.S. banking system, but when we use that ATM card and put that into the ATM, then we note that we're going to have to enter different codes, and we're going to have to have different ways of accessing that system. That doesn't mean that we each individually cannot access the system. It just means that we have different types of access because of our uh, access our access privileges. Like I, my ATM card and my code is going to access a different account than your ATM and uh, card and your code. That's kind of how we view a, a asymmetric key encryption is that we all utilize a different form to access the same information sets. 
All right. Now here's where we're going to go down the rabbit hole. And I will tell you right now, I do not consider myself an expert in this area. Uh, it's uh, very basic, but there are some resources I can give you that can give you more detail if you're interested in this, uh, this information. So modern key communication of privileged information frequently employs both asymmetric key encryption and authentication to further increase information security, which is something we've seen in our courses before, our, our class sessions before, is utilization of multiple metrics or multiple items to actually increase security. They can also additional, incorporate additional layers of security. So hashing utilizes an algorithm to ensure that it was received, that the file that was received is identical in context what is sent. Okay. So hashing is similar to encryption, except it's not reversible. The way to think about hashing, it, it, and this is just a general concern about algorithms. You've probably heard that term algorithm before, and you said, uh, I can look this up, but I'm not really familiar with an algorithm. And the way that I kind of simply define algorithm, it's, it's, basically, it, it's basically a qualitative equation. It's a series of instructions. So we can use kind of the equation, uh, the equation protocol to, to kind of explain how hashing works. So think about that I send you two numbers. I send you the number 18 and 6. And I say, you need to determine what the result is from those two numbers. What are the mathematical operations that you could use to with those two numbers? You could add them together. You could put a plus sign in the middle of them. You could say, that's 24. Or you could subtract them and say, 18 minus 6 is 12. You could multiply them, which is some number that I'm not going to calculate right now. Very large number. Actually, I could calculate that. Would have been to be 108. Okay. As I was talking, I was thinking to myself, what is that number? All right. So then you could divide them. 18 divided by 6 is 3. But without knowing what the operation is, you can't solve that particular equation. That's the same thing with hashing, except it occurs on a much higher level of much, much greater magnitude is there's a whole lot of series of processes that you have to go through, probably a whole lot of different items that you have to go walk through as well. It's not just a simple one item transaction. So that would be an example of hashing is that, that use that algorithm. And the nice thing about hashing is that you can't really reverse engineer it. It's not something that you can do or you can uh, figure out through it. Encryption, you have to know what the algorithm is to solve the problem. And then encryption and hashing are using together, and you can't see it on, on screen because for some reason, even though it's supposed to be blued out, it says digital signatures. And I've got a slide explaining digital signatures. So I want to make some notes on this. First of all, no, I will not test you on this. I barely understand this information myself. This is more for your benefit. And the reason that this is whited out right here, it's, it was blue when I created it, which I thought, okay, that'll be an easy way to show that there's a link. This actually is accessible. Or you can actually go through this link and you can access uh, CISA's, uh, organization, or CISA, which is a Cybersecurity Infrastructure and Security Agency. They actually explain how digital signatures work. And it's kind of complex technical jargon, but it does give you a little bit of a better insight as to what that diagram that's in the slides represents. Suffice to say that it's very, very complex. There's a lot of steps that go through it. Again, it's involving both encryption and hashing in together to create these digital signatures. So there's multiple multiple levels of security with respect to these items. All right, let's move on to something I am more familiar with. So let's talk a little bit about this, this concept called Cressy's hypothesis. So in 1953, Dr. Donald Cressy, uh, I believe he is a professor, he's a professor of sociology. I, 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 I know that it's in that area, but I can't, right? I'm not 100% certain that's area, that that's the exact area. <laughs> but he wrote the following statement, trusted persons become trust violators when they conceive of themselves as having financial problem, having a financial problem, which is non-shareable, aware that this problem can be secret resolved by violation of the position of financial trust and are able to apply their own conduct in situation, this, that situation verbalizations, which enable them to adjust their conception of themselves as trusted persons with their conceptions of themselves as being users of the trusted funds or property. So Cressy's hypothesis was trying to identify what conditions have to exist in order for fraud, fraudulent activity to occur? And so we started learning ways to simplify this a little bit more easily. So you'll notice I under underlined certain parts, and that's because these were relates to what's in the next slide. So the first part says having a financial problem was non-shareable. And the way that was later uh, discussed, described when we, we put it into context is saying this is an incentive or a pressure that exists. Okay. Then next, we'd say this problem can be secretly resolved by the position of financial trust. This is going to call opportunity. An opportunity exists that something can actually be uh, can take place. And then are able to apply themselves their own conduct situation versus that situation verbalizations and able to adjust them conceptions themselves as trusted persons. This is an attitude or rationalization. And the idea behind this being is that all three of these factors have to be presented present in order for a fraud to occur in the organization. So we can actually put this into a little bit easier context. It's something called 
the fraud triangle, all right? So incentive, opportunity, or center for pressure, opportunity, and then attitude or rationalization. Now, I like to use this example because this sets the context for how I talk about this within this course. Obviously, when we talk about fraud in this course, we're more concerned about the business aspects of fraud. But fraud is, in general, any time that you're basically breaking the rules. So let's use a very simple example. Let's say, talk about cheating in this class. Can you actually develop uh, pressures, opportunities, and rationalizations that would relate to that concept? Well, it's very easy. You think about pressure. Pressure, take uh, you're cheating on the next exam. You're trying to think about whether you want to cheat on the next exam. So, well, I didn't do well in the first exam, and I really need the A in this course. So I think I'm just going to make some notes so that I can actually be prepared. And Dr. Barnes, Dr. Barnes is is is. Well, we'll talk about it in a second. So you're going to make a, a note card so that you actually have your notes and you can access that information when you go to the no, go to the exam. And the opportunity, okay? Now I say that I watch you all take your exam, but you know better that, that I, get, I get bored really easily. And of course, I start playing on my iPad, start answering emails, and then you know looking up stuff like CISA infrastructure uh, websites and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, you, know, you might note that the opportunity is is that once I, I once I stop paying attention, you can start looking at that note card and saying, all right. That's the answer to that question. I remember I took that down, all right? What's the rationalization? Rationalization is Dr. Barnes is completely unfair. He asks really, really, he, he he tries to teach us the stuff. The questions he asks on the exam are not anything related. Instead of putting instead of putting memes on the exam the way he does in the slide, he asks the real questions on the exam, which is unfair. Totally unfair. Totally uncalled for in this course, okay? So very easy to understand how this operates with respect to something that's, that's, that's related to you. Now, of course, all three of these things have to be present, okay? And we think about this from the context of business. We try to say, limit the opportunity. I try to limit the opportunity of students cheating by paying attention to what you all are doing in the exam. But even if that was not the case, even if I was a slacker, you know, which I, I tend to slack off sometimes, there may be people in this room who may say, it doesn't matter what incentive or opportunity I have, I'm not going to cheat on an exam. That's just not my nature. And if, by the way, if you all are in that room, thank you very much. You know, make my life a lot easier. I appreciate that. Anyway, uh, so... Let's talk about this from respect to accounting information system, how this actually relates to AIS. All right. So according to the IIA, which is the Institute for Internal Auditors, common computer frauds include the following. All right. So the theft, misuse, or misappropriation of assets by altering computer readable records or files. So we've talked about this a little bit already in this course. It's pretty obvious when we get down to it is that if you think about how we want to actually steal something from an organization, say you're working for a company or you're like, you know what, I could really use some extra cash so I can sell some inventory on the side. How could you get away with that? You could go into the computer system and say, all right, I'm eliminating these, these 500 inventory items because they were, they, were, they were thrown away due to spoilage. When they weren't in fact thrown away due to spoilage, they were thrown away because you put them in the back of your car and sold them on eBay. Okay, So that would be a one easy example. Uh, then we have the theft, misuse, and misappropriation assets by altering the logic of computer software. Now, the way that I like to explain this, it's a little bit dated, but has anybody ever seen the movie Office Space? It's a little bit old. It's about 20 years old, but uh, there's a scheme that goes in there in the Office Space. And again, old movie, so you may not get this, but basically what they did is they changed the uh, changed the payroll system because the payroll system rounded out uh, numbers, and they basically said anytime that there's a rounding that takes place beyond two decimal places – that goes into a bank account, and we actually get to take the money from that bank account, which, uh, by the way, uh, the rounding didn't work out. They actually rounded to zero decimal places, which everybody threw a panic then. It's kind of like, okay, the numbers are wrong. But, uh, sorry, I spoiled this for the movie. Sorry, guys. You're going to plan on watching the movie. I just spoiled it for you. Sorry. My apologies. Okay. Put that in my evaluation. Spoils movies. All right. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's again, in a pretty exotic situation. But if we think about this sort of more basic situation, if uh, we uh, change the logic of the system and say any time that there's going to be a, a extra item that's shipped back to the manufacturer, instead it's basically kept in the warehouse in a separate spot, and then you take that home, that would be a very simple logic that could actually be executed within an organization. Uh, theft and illegal use of computer readable is information itself. If you think about this from a uh, perspective of the first two, this seems a lot less obvious because this is talking about a digital asset instead of a tangible asset. But as a lot of organizations have identified is that digital information and the, the, just basically the, the, this, this intangible information that's held by organizations represents a much bigger value than that, than the actual assets of organizations themselves. So you may find this if you go off to work. In fact, you will find this if you go off to work uh, for an organization. They will hand you your computer and they will say, protect this computer with your life. Do you think it's because they're really concerned about the actual computer itself? The computer may cost a thousand or two thousand dollars, and they're really concerned about the two thousand dollars 
of actual physical hardware? No, they're probably concerned about the actual information that you're carrying on that computer, like uh, sensitive information about their customers and their vendors that they don't want people to have access to, which is why there's so much security surrounding it that, because the actual information is worth a lot more than the physical hardware itself. Uh, theft, corruption, corruption, illegal copying, intentional destruction of computer software. I don't know about intentional destruction of computer software, but definitely theft and corruption of a, a computer software is certainly problematic. Corruption from this perspective, we're not talking about corrupting beyond use, but using it for unintended purposes. So example of that might be is that you've got a program that's proprietary and you have to pay a subscription fee for it. And instead, you take that, you copy it, and you make tweaks to it so that you can use it for your own benefit. Certainly problematic. You've probably heard the term piracy before. In fact, some of you may have experienced that before, where this, this is really, really common with video games nowadays, is they became, become put it online and you can actually put it on your computer and play it on your computer. It says, well, it's free. I'm a college student. I'm poor. I should be able to play this. Yeah, well, the idea being is that you're taking somebody that's actually somebody's uh, somebody's uh, asset that they created, some, some uh, piece of uh, proprietary knowledge that they created and using it for unintended use. So that'd be an example of kind of the corruption that's being talked about here. The same idea behind theft and misuse and misappropriation of computer hardware. This seems pretty uh, apparent. If you steal something, a piece of computer hardware, that's obvious. But this can also be something a lot less obvious, a lot less apparent if we think about this from the context of the interconnectivity of systems nowadays. So there was certainly a problem back in the 2010s, and I think it still exists nowadays, though to a lesser degree, about organizations operating off of their clients' systems. So they get access to a client system and they start storing information on the client system because if they store it on the client system, then they don't have to store it on their own system. They don't have to pay the storage costs. And then other organizations start using systems that were not their own because they were interconnected to be able to actually run processes. There was a real problem with Bitcoin mining taking place uh, in the late 2010s where that was happening, where companies did not have all of the infrastructure they needed to do the full algorithm mining. So they said, let's connect to a system that's not our own get unauthorized access to it and use that computer to actually perform the tasks for us. That would be an example of type of uh, misappropriation of hard computer hardware. That's not really obvious, but it's still kind of apparent or still kind of relevant in this particular context. All right. With respect to how we actually go about prevention and detection, there are a few things we need to be concerned about. So first of all, uh, prevention, we should actually definitely have a fraud risk assessment performed by, uh, by management. This is something that your financial statement auditors will come in and say, this has to occur. You have to do this every single year. You have to make sure that this is very detailed and very diligent. And it's becoming more and more prominent as days go by because fraud is becoming more prominent as days go by. As technology evolves, fraud becomes easier to perpetrate. So we need to make, make sure that we understand what the risks are with respect to that. <laughs> also, we need to make sure that there's a strong audit committee that has oversight of internal and external auditors simply because the audit committee is going to make sure that the work of the internal and external auditors actually gets performed. So the financial statement auditors come in and tell management, you need to do this. Audit committee sets the hammer down, says this absolutely needs to be done. So, and we've talked about this, we're gonna talk about this concept. We've talked about it a little bit already, but we're gonna talk about this concept more in, in chapter 13 when we get to it next week. One of the most important concerns with respect to controls is going to be how well do the people at the top consider these controls? How, how much do they support this, these ideas of controls? If there's no support, then there's not going to be no basically no control system in place. And then finally, communication and training of employees to make them aware of their responsibilities. This is obviously one of the most important things. You can have a great control system, but if nobody knows what they were supposed to do, then nobody's going to follow those rules. This is something that I encountered, uh, again, going back to that example of cheating a class. So first of all, let me say that the incidences I've had at Truman State of cheating have been extremely minimal. It happens so rarely that it could basically not happen at all. It has happened, though, and the excuse that I had in some situations is that some people said, well, you didn't specifically forbid this. So if you don't communicate your expectations, then people may use that as an incident in order to be able to actually perform acts that they shouldn't necessarily be able to do. If you don't explicitly communicate what people can and cannot do within a system. So prevention, obviously very important. Prevention is only half the equation. The other half, detection. So if fraud does occur, what do we need to have in place to make sure that we can find it? The first step is going to be business process evaluation process evaluation by internal auditors. So these people working within the organization, making sure they understand how do the business processes operate? And if people are not following their process guidelines, is there going to be an issue? We've already talked about this to some degree. Remember with respect to business processes, we said 
one of the most important things that we can have is we can have separation of responsibilities, or as I like to call it, segregation of duties. Okay. With segregation of duties, that in ensures that people are not performing tasks that they are not authorized to do. And we've seen that multiple times throughout this course. We've seen it with NetSuite. We've seen it with my examples in class. I kind of hammered that home. I showed you the picture of the car and said C-A-R. It's really, really important to have that in place because that tries to make sure that we don't have these problems that would exist with respect to fraud. Because if segregation of duties does not exist, fraud is much easier to take place. Also perform transaction analysis of data, examine the effectiveness of internal controls and any indicators of fraudulent activity. Obviously, with respect to uh, infectious internal controls, we're going to examine the information itself to see, does this consistent with a strong internal control structure? If we see problems, then that may indicate that our controls are not sound. More importantly, when we actually look at the data itself, and that's kind of harkening back to the data analytics we were talking back in chapter 12, we look at the uh, chapter 10, excuse me, chapter 10, we look at indicators of fraud activity. If we see something that should not be taking place, like large inventory purchases from an unauthorized vendor, then that may be an indicator that there's something untoward taking place that we need to be aware of as an organization. And then finally, continuous monitoring of that transaction activity. This is something that's becoming more and more prominent over time, but if we can see how transactions are taking place, and more importantly, if we can see the transactions that are kind of suspicious that are taking place that should not be taking place, then we can better identify when things like this occur. So to wrap up, I wanna talk a little bit about this concept of system availability, okay? So this is something again, that we're all very familiar with because we had some system availability issues just less than a year ago, all right? And a key component of IT service delivery is making sure that data is available when needed. And there's basically two categories of system availability. There's preventative, which basically tries to prevent the system from, or prevent any interruptions from taking place. Or if interruption does occur, we have a corrective approach that's in place. So these sound like controls. And in fact, this is a form of control because we have talked about preventative and corrective controls. But uh, these are very specific to this idea of system availability. All right. <clears throat> so with respect to preventative, one of the big big ones that we can talk about is having an interrupt inter uninterruptible power supply. So the power goes down, the computer itself, the computer system itself does not go down, at least not immediately. So these are going to be very, very big in a lot of organizations. I don't think this would happen at Truman State. I think if the power went down in this building, then my recording on Zoom would just be done. Okay, just be like, oh, I guess your, your lecture was over. So we probably don't have that in place in Truman State. But if we're talking about a much larger organization, this could be really important, especially organizations that are perpetually processing transactions that need to be recorded on a timely basis. Okay. Fault tolerance, fault tolerance. It's basically basically talking about whenever something takes place that uh, it can actually address the issue in a timely manner. If something occurs, then it actually identifies what the issue is and address and uh, picks up the problem and addresses the issue in, 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 in short order. So this again, would be a form of control and identifying that if there's a problem that takes place, we know what the problem is and we can address it or as, as quickly as possible. And then preventative, one big preventative control is going to be virtualization or cloud computing. This takes the data and puts it out of our hands, which is a security concern, admittedly, but also keeps, keeps the information fairly secure for us. So if our system goes down right now, am I going to lose all the data that's on the computer? The answer is no. I've got it on the Google Drive or I've got it on the Microsoft OneDrive. So we've got access to, access to it through an external system. That system itself would have to be have to go down and have to be wiped out before we lose access to the information. The information on the computer system, the Truman computer system, that that information is going to be limited in scope. And that's one of the big reasons we were able to recover so quickly from the uh, from the ransomware attack last year is that a lot of our system information was kept on clouds as opposed to kept on the cloud instead of uh, kept being kept locally. Then corrective, we have something called disaster recovery planning. So disaster recovery planning, basically uh, during or after disaster, it's trying to make sure that we restore ad, uh, IT data and uh, or IT and data access as quickly as possible. So we're trying to make sure that uh, when something takes place, what are the protocols for getting us back online? This was probably something that if I were if I were to have any criticism of Truman State is that we did not have good disaster recovery planning in place because it was so unexpected that something like that was going to happen. So nobody really knew what to do after the ransomware attack took place. That's not the fault of ITS. It's more along the lines of we got so many disparate, uh, disparate different groups and people who do things differently that when it was like, okay, you no longer have access to the system, you no longer have access to the slides, but you still have to teach your courses. Everybody's like, I don't know what to do anymore. I'm lost. 
except for Professor Smith. He was just kind of like, I'm just going to keep keep doing what I do, you know, yeah, keep doing what I do. He'd been operating this stuff for, for, for many, many years. And he was just like, yeah, I don't, this is not going to affect me at all. You know, computer, who needs it? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and then business continuity management, which is basically saying keeping the business operational. So trying to make sure that the that we find ways that we can actually keep the business operational, even absent the system itself. This is going to be a little bit more dicey. It's uh, going to be a little bit more uh, challenging because we don't know what the nature of the disaster is going to be. We don't know what the nature of the interruption is going to be, but we should have protocols in place that actually specify if there is interruption this is our second step. This is our third step. And this is what we do to make sure that the business can maintain itself, even in the face of a disaster and adversity. All right. That's it for this chapter. We are back in here. Actually, hold on. Hold on. I'm going to I'm going to send you an email. I need to talk about this camera because uh, if our presenter is here and we don't have a camera operational, that creates problems. So I'm assuming we're going to be back in here. But if I, if I see, receive an email for me, keep an eye out for it. I may say we're up in the other room just simply because the camera may not work in this room. But regardless, I'll see you all on Wednesday. Please complete your questions.